Hello, welcome to today's episode of Juicing the Numbers. I am your host, Joshua Tracy. And I'm Corwin Heller. And uh, it, it's February 7th. There ain't shit going on. So we were trying to decide what to talk about for today. And uh, it being February, it's Black History Month. And that means yet again, we get the opportunity, although there's never a poor time to talk about it, the Negro Leagues. Um, for anyone unaware, baseball was segregated as most things in America were for a long time. And in the time in which it was segregated, there was uh, a eventually organized league of teams focused solely on black players in the U.S. Those were called the Negro Leagues, or it was called the Negro League. And those were the, uh, the various teams making it up, including such storied franchises as the Kansas City Monarchs, um, the Chicago uh, Cuban Giants is what I think they went by officially. Um, X Giants, so I'll have to look it up to be more precise. American Giants, there it is. There's oh, the New York Cuban Giants, uh, the Newark Eagles, the St. Louis Stars, the uh, Indianapolis Clowns, a whole bunch of yeah, there's the Cuban X Giants, there's a whole bunch of Giants, there's the Chicago Columbia Giants, there's a whole bunch of Giants, a lot of giants. um, the New York Lincoln Giants. Wow, it's a lot of Giants, <laughs> um, anyway. So hold on, there's the Chicago X, no, there's the Cuban X Giants, the Chicago Leland Giants, and the Chicago American Giants. Um, so as you can tell, just based on this two minutes of me babbling, the Negro League's history is deep and can at times be complicated because there's a lot of it that was organized and there's a lot of it that was unorganized. And that's because imagine trying to run a baseball league or a sports league of any kind in the 30s while black. Um, you probably didn't get very far because you ain't got no money and white people ain't going to give you any money unless they want to run the show. And you probably don't want to let white people run the show because that shit's yours. So it can be a little bit all over the place. So if this episode's a little bit all over the place. I apologize. But I ha- also highly recommend checking out some of the resources available from the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City. I've been there. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, Love, love, love that place. So if this episode interests you a bit, check them out. It's a cool place. You ready to dive in, Corwin? I'm ready to dive in. (laughs) All right, let's dive in. Uh, I I know we we've talked kind of in passing about the Negro Leagues before. We had a, a short episode on it last year. What are some things that come to mind when you think of the Negro Leagues? Uh, that really good pitcher that I'm forgetting his name of Satchel uh, Page. Satchel Page, yeah. Uh, and that's pretty much all I know about them. How about Jackie Robinson? Right, Jackie Robinson. But I don't really can. When I think of the Negro Leagues, I don't think of Jackie Robinson. No, that's fair. I'm I'm giving um, you some names that you would definitely know that were that are right, well right, associated. Right, right. How about Hank Aaron? Ooh, I didn't know Hank Aaron played there. Hank Aaron was actually the last player in the MLB when he retired to have played in the Negro Leagues. Wow. In large that's, part because his career yeah. was fucking long. I'm pulling up his baseball reference page just to see. <laughs> Holy shit. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, he played forever. He has he is a twenty five time All Star. Yeah, remember we talked about this because um, there were a couple of years where he was an All Star twice because there was a couple of years there were two All Star games. That's insane. Oh uh, fuck yeah, you're right. Damn it. Still one, two, three, four, five. I'm not counting that. He was twenty one individual years of being voted into the All Star game. Yeah, literally every year of his career except for his first year and his last year. Mm-hmm. That's also it. leads all of MLB history in RBI and total bases. Yeah, and when he retired, he also led all of MLB in uh, hits and home runs. That's impressive. Yeah. Uh, one of the greatest players of all time. Mm-hmm. Uh, he started his career, though, I believe, with the Indianapolis Clowns. Um, I don't have the Negro Leagues up right here. I can't. Uh, I Unfortunately, I, can I was digging around a little bit, and I'm not sure that the that Baseball Reference hosts that information. Hmm. So, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. It yeah, it doesn't look like they do. Back. It just does MLB and minor league stuff. Yeah, I'm looking and I I don't see any of any kind. I see a uh, a few uh, assorted minor league teams that he played with before getting called up to the big club, but I don't see his um. He it doesn't matter. So young when he played in the Negro leagues because he's yes. 20 years old when he debuted in the MLB. Yeah, not to make this a whole Hank Aaron episode, although it certainly it could be. be. Hank Aaron is a phenomenal ball player, person, ambassador for the sport, and ambassador for the Negro Leagues. But yeah, he was playing for the Indianapolis Clowns, if memory serves correctly, because I don't have this in front of me, but it was talked about at the Negro League Museum. Um, he, he was with the Clowns and he was 17. Holy shit. Yeah, no, he, he so he basically played baseball professionally from age 17 to 42. Um. Yeah, he played shortstop for the Negro American League's Indianapolis Clowns for three months. Um, do 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 do. That's all the uh Negro League Baseball Museum has on him in the Negro Leagues. Yeah, and then I believe he joined um the Braves organization pretty young. Mm-hmm. Uh, does, anyway, yeah, Hank Aaron, who we will certainly be looping back to, uh, one of the the big shining stars of the Negro Leagues, looking or a, a big shining star of MLB, whose roots extend into the Negro Leagues, I should say. Um, some of the most decorated teams in the Negro Leagues, uh, the Chicago American Giants, won fourteen championships. They were an active franchise from nineteen ten to nineteen forty eight. The Kansas City Monarchs and the Homestead Grays, two of, I think, the most recognizable Negro League teams, each won 10. Uh, and they also played, uh, the Monarchs were from 1920 to 1948, and the Homestead Grays from 1912 to 1948. Um, and if you're thinking to yourself, hey, all these teams basically ended 1948. Yes. <laughs> Some of them extended a little bit beyond it, but not by much. And that's because when Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier, well, MLB teams started to actually hire black ball players, which means that the Negro Leagues was losing their best players, which made them less of a draw, and they just kind of slowly petered out. So top talent was leaving, crowds were following the top talent, and eventually the bottom just kind of fell out. Um, which is so interesting because it's not how leagues usually fail or mm-hmm. end. Like like the AFL didn't die. The AFL merged with the NFL and then became the NFL. And then the USFL just died because it was poorly run. But also like the first edition of the XFL. Like usually when you hear about leagues dying, it's because they're just not run well. Not because like, like to have your league end because of um, like societal progress is a fascinating way for your tenure as an organization to conclude, you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like to see your league in this case be essentially just, it becomes outdated, but it's, but the way it becomes outdated is such a progressive and, you know, empowering thing for the players of your own league. I can't think of any other, you know, any other sport, uh, maybe with basketball. No, because that was even a merger then. Like, this is the only just, uh, God, man, words are real hard today. Only time this has happened in my memory. Yeah, I, it really is very, very unique in that way. Um, it's it's such a such a fascinating piece of history. And it's been very well preserved by the Negro League Baseball Museum. They are very particular not to call them a Hall of Fame. They are a museum because they want to recognize all players, which I think is just lovely. Um, The man who runs it is also fucking lovely. Um, So check them out on Twitter if you get the chance because he posts a lot. He's he's great. So I figured maybe it'd be interesting to work our way backwards a little bit in terms of the final world championship uh, for the Negro Leagues, and then work our way back as far as we can because the beginning of it's the murkiest part. Obviously, history gets a little bit cleaner in terms of uh, recognition of, of series of events, the more recent it is. So in 1948, 
the Washington Homestead Grays. Again, one of those very recognizable names if you're familiar with the uh, the history of the Negro Leagues. The Homestead Grays, a very famous team. Josh Gibson, one of their most notable players, defeated the Birmingham Black Barons uh, four games to one in 1948. And uh, let's see, what's your impression of... Um, no, let's see who's on these, these this team. Uh, oh, I clicked on the wrong thing. I'm sorry. I might have to edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to see who was on the teams. Ah, okay. In, in this World Series, there was another 17-year-old future Inner Circle Hall of Famer. Any guess as to who that would have been? Ooh. Um, what year? 1948. Playing Ooh. for the Birmingham Black Barons. Inner Circle Hall of Famer. Was it Satchel Page? No, no. Willie Mays. Oh, okay. 17 year old Willie Mays playing in his first postseason games there in, uh, in, in, in the Negro League World Series in 1948. Willie May is also going to have a 22 year long career and is sitting fifth all time in in uh, war at 156.4. Willie uh, May is a colossal baseball player. Yeah, a scrub compared to uh, Hank Aaron as he only has 24 all star selections. Oh, what a puss. Uh, yeah, God damn. And that's ain't that some shit. Yeah, um, I couldn't imagine, you know, even not knowing of these guys as well as I know, you know, modern ball players for obvious reasons that we've gone into in the past. But going up against, you know, uh, I don't even know how to compare this to active players, but it'd be like having two Mike Trouts in the same minor league lineup. Oh, I'd say it's certainly fair. Uh, I, I mean, it. To have a 17-year-old ball player to begin with is ridiculous. And then to to think that that's going to become like can you imagine being Hank Aaron or or um Willie Mays at the time at which they were playing seven 17-year-old dudes playing in the Negro Leagues where like you know integration was like around the corner but like you can't ever be sure on that kind of shit. You know, you can't sit yourself like it's not like being in the minor leagues where you're like I'm definitely going to the majors. Like I know I'm good enough. I'm going to do it. You don't know shit. Like it's it's the forties. Shit could just easily easily could have just gotten worse for black people, based on the way the U.S. treats every minority in the world. And then all of a sudden, you are two of the greatest baseball players of all time. Not all of a sudden, but like you have you then end up having a career spanning nearly a quarter of a decade. Unfathomable. I yeah, I could not even begin to imagine that. Another Hall of Famer was also in this series. He was playing for um, the Washington Homestead Grays, Buck Leonard, often referred to as the Black Lou Gehrig. Um, I am unfamiliar with that player. Yeah, yeah, you know he one of uh, one of the greats of of his time. I'm not sure he ever played in the. Did he play in the uh, MLB? I'm not sure he did. I have to check. I don't think he did. I think he might have just been a strictly a Negro leaguer. Fair enough. Yeah, it's looking like he was. I don't believe he played any any time in the in the um in the MLB. Although that is one of the nice things that the MLB has been relatively decent about is putting players who never played in the MLB into the Hall of Fame. So Buck Leonard, though he was never in the MLB, has a plaque in Cooperstown. He is in the Hall of Fame as a first baseman. And that's really fucking nice that they do that shit. And mm -hmm. and not, also, if they didn't do it, they would be so very, very wrong for not doing it. But it is also nice that they do do it because the MLB is slow moving progress wise. And, um, you know, I'd say most sports leagues are somewhat behind the times, but for them to be as proactive as they have been with promoting black baseball is pretty cool. Um, his career stats, you might ask, uh, Buck Leonard, 15 seasons, all of which with the 
Homestead Grays, 412 games because seasons were pretty short back then. Um, so he had 471 hits, 73 doubles, three, 26 triples, 60 home runs, 275 RBIs, um, two, 25 stolen bases, 257 walks, a lifetime 320 batting average, and 527 slugging percent. Um, there you go. Yeah, these are, these are the kind of guys I kind of wish I could have known about more. God, words are fucking hard today. Um, you know, it's like score one of every these... every episode. I know, I know. Uh, fuck it. All right, I'm done. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> uh, the World Series before that, in the 1947 Negro League World Series, was uh, when the New York Cubans bested the Cleveland Buckeyes four games to one with one tie. I don't know how that works, but in the post, like in what in the World Series. Um, so if I had to, oh, one game was called after a tie after six innings due to rain. <laughs> Imagine that shit happening today. Like, I game, can't game four of the World Series, you know, make it or break it game for the team. Ah, it's raining. Yeah, we'll it's actually game on. one, too. Game one was tied 5 5. And then game two, the Cleveland Buckeyes won 10 to 7. Game three, the Cubans came back, won 6 to nothing. And then game four, the Cubans won again, 9 to 4. The game five, they won 9 to 2. And then game six, they won 6 to 5 to get a 4 1 1 um, and win the series. Baseball's so weird. God, I know. Isn't it the best? <laughs> uh, the year before that, 1946, the Newark Eagles beat the Kansas City Monarchs. Uh, they won in seven games, a hell of a series. Um, so four to three with uh, one of these games being won by the Monarchs, 15 to five. God, can you imagine that what that game must have been like? Not at all. Uh, in this game, Hall of Famers, the Newark Eagles on that team had Leon Day, Larry Doby, Monte Irvin and Biz Mackey in Kansas City. Yeah, Kansas City Hall of Famers, Willard Brown, Hilton Smith, and Satchel Page. Hey, I've heard of that Satchel Page guy. Yeah, I I I only recognize Larry Doby of the other names, which I know is a shame because I would like to say I recognize all the names. Uh Monte Irvin sounds familiar as too, but Leon Day and Biz Mackey don't come don't come up in my mind, nor does Willard Brown. Uh Larry Doby, for anyone who was unaware. Uh, was the first black major league baseball player to play for the Cleveland Indians. So that's the reason I know who he is. Uh, Monte Irvin. Oh, yeah. Ma yeah, Monte Irvin. Okay. I, I, I still am like iffy, but he played for the Giants for a long time. Um, also in the Hall of Fame, won a World Series in 19, like an MLB World Series in 1954 with the Giants. That's, my, that's how his name is familiar. Um, and then, yeah, Leon Day, Biz Mackey, I don't, I don't have off the dome. And I'm sorry to those people, but I can't be Are perfect. You? I have a little bit. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, 1945, the Cleveland Buckeyes beat the Washington Homestead Grays in a four-game sweep. Just to read out the rest of these real quick. 44, the Homestead Grays beat the Black Barons, the Birmingham Black Barons. That's right. It's the second time they've faced each other. But what's this? A third time when the Washington Homestead Grays beat the Birmingham Black Barons. In eight games, four games, four wins, three losses, and another tie. Um, and then in 1942, the Kansas City Monarchs beat the Washington Homestead Grays in a four-game sweep. So the, in, from 42 to 48, the Grays were in all but two World Series, having won three and lost two. Ain't that some shit? Uh, that is, in fact, some shit. Uh, Hall of Famers on the 1955 were in the 1955 45 World Series. Only Washington had them. Cool. Papa Bell, hmm. Ray Brown, Josh Gibson, Buck Leonard, and Judd Wilson. A couple names we've already mentioned. Um, in the 1944 World Series, there was uh, there's going to be a lot of repeats here. It's uh, all the same names because the world the Grays won that one too. In the 1942 World Series, Willard Brown, Satchel Paige, and Hilton Smith were on Kansas City with all the same names repeating on the um, Homestead Grays. And uh, 
and yeah, that's pretty much that's pretty much it for the the kind of waning years of the Negro Leagues in terms of um well no Negro waning years of the Negro Leagues end of sentence. They kind of concluded post forty eight. But um these teams had some very, very impressive ball players on them. These are these are some very recognizable names in the in the ether of baseball. Right. And it's it's one of those things where like it's hard to look back and say like, oh, I miss the Negro Leagues because what the existence of the leagues represent. It's, you know, you could say like, oh man, that was a really, you know, important part of history. You know, I miss having you know, those events, those players, those teams, all that. But it's hard for me to look back and say, oh, I miss the league itself. It's a really cool piece of history because it really shows um, finding light in the face of discrimination, you know, mm-hmm. really putting a, a the best face possible on such difficult circumstances because the Negro leagues were this beautiful invention born out of necessity because of racism and hatred. And it's so weird to kind of look at that and feel proud because if there wasn't segregation, that that wouldn't have been an issue. Mm -hmm. There would never have been a Negro league. So it came out something terrible, but you can't help, at least I can't help but look look at the Negro Leagues as part of U.S. history and think that it's just such a beautiful thing that managed to be done, and all the amazing stories that managed to come out of it. You know, given given the the, the situation that these people and these teams were put in, doing what they did is just so impressive and honestly just very inspiring. Yeah, I agree. So to give some some recognition to a few players, including a bunch of names we already read, um, here I'm going to list all of the Negro Leaguers who are currently in the MLB Hall of Fame. Luckily, there's not too many, but, uh, well, I shouldn't say luckily. Uh, lucky for me doing the reading, there's a, there's a very readable number of names. Um, but I will give you the name and the, t- the Negro League team uh, that each of these people played for. Hank Aaron, I think we all know. He was a shortstop for the Indianapolis Clowns, as Corbin said earlier. Cool Papa Bell, one of the greatest nicknames ever. <laughs> um, he's played center field for the Homestead Grays. Oscar Charleston, center fielder for the Pittsburgh Crawfords. Pittsburgh, a wonderful history of Negro League Baseball in, in Pittsburgh, might I just say. I can appreciate that. Yeah, to shout out to... That, that was also one of the big things that, like for like Roberto Clemente is that he was playing in a team in a city that like had such a deep baseball history. Like the fact that Pittsburgh is such a bad team now and the, the city often forgets it in light of the two significantly better franchises that play in that city cannot be understated how much of a crime that is. Like it, yeah. it would, it would be like, like the Yankees having terrible ownership. I know that that the I know that it sounds silly because the Yankees play in New York and there's all that money and they have a deep history of winning, whereas like Pittsburgh doesn't. But that's that's not the point. The point is that there's history of baseball in New York and there's probably just as deep, if not deeper, a history of baseball in Pittsburgh. And the fact that 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 team is bad with shitty ownership who doesn't care is the real travesty. Yeah, thanks, Bob Nutting. Fuck you, Bob Nutting. There was a just a, a small tangent. There was a post on the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates subreddit today, basically saying how we could get rid of Bob Nutting, and it's basically a befriend him and then betray him with a knife in the back. And man, a lot of people were on board with just destroying his personal life. I think we need not we need to start doing hits on <laughs> on these people, and like not murder hits though. We need to start doing weird specific like. Donald Sterling style hits where we get all these old white dudes to like get black girlfriends who then just like expose their racism until they get him <laughs> forced to sell the team. I'm totally for it. Cause like, I bet most of these owners are like, like that. 
<laughs> Donald Sterling is definitely not the only one. Oh, God, no. Uh, anyway, uh, Ray Dandridge played third base for the Newark Eagles. Leon Day, pitcher, second baseman, and outfielder for the Newark Eagles. This one's hilarious. Martin DeHigo played every position for the New York Cubans. Larry Doby, second baseman for the Newark Eagles. Bill Foster, pitcher for the Chicago American Giants. Rube Foster, who is a pitcher, a manager, and the organizer of the Negro Leagues. He, the Negro Leagues are heavily credited to him. There were Negro teams. Oh, I felt gross to say. Um, like black baseball teams that were playing loose games against other black teams and Hispanic teams and white teams and whatever. The Rube Foster was the guy that actually brought them all together and formed a formal Negro Leagues. Um, so he is in as a member of the Chicago American Giants. You know, he was inducted in 1981. Josh I was just Gibson. about to ask you if he was in the Hall of Fame. Yes, yes, he is. Very stupid. Uh, oh, yeah, no. I, I get that because you're reading it out. Nah. Yeah, I wasn't going to say it. Uh, Josh Gibson, <laughs> catcher for the Homestead Grays. Josh Gibson, affectionately referred to as the Black Babe Ruth. Monte Irvin, shortstop for the Newark Eagles. Judy, Judy Johnson, third baseman for the Hill, Hilldale Daisies. Buck Leonard, first baseman for the Homestead Grays. Pop Lloyd, shortstop for the Chicago American Giants. Willie Mays, center fielder of the Birmingham Black Barons. Satchel Page, pitcher for the Kansas City Monarchs. Jackie Robinson, shortstop for the Kansas City Monarchs. Bullet Rogan, pitcher for the Kansas City Monarchs. Hilton Smith, pitcher for the Kansas City Monarchs. Turkey Stearns. Center fielder for the Detroit Stars, Willie Wells, shortstop for the St. Louis Stars, and Smokey Joe Williams, pitcher for the New York Lincoln Giants. Uh, that is also, actually, no, Hilton Smith, it appears, is, th is the most recent addition to the Hall of Fame. He was added in 2001. Um, what's interesting is uh, Satchel Page, his addition in 1971, uh, has him listed as being the quote unquote first Negro leaguer to be added to the hall of fame. Although Jackie Robinson was added in 1962, I believe the reason he is listed as being the first one is because he played the bulk of his career in the Negro leagues, not in the, uh, the major leagues. Um, another caveat I would just like to add because team financing was difficult and teams often fluctuated between being able to afford players and not a lot of these players played on a lot of different teams so the team name that i read is likely just the team that they are most known for playing for but not necessarily and in fact in all likelihood very much so not the only team that they played for um but these are the, a very small exclusive list of Black, black, black baseball players who played in the Negro Leagues and are currently residing in the MLB Hall of Fame. Yeah. It's a it's a hell of a list, man. It's a it's a fun list, you know? It's it's a fun part of baseball. Well, I don't know if fun is It's that's what I was saying, like you want I want to look at it fondly because it's such an fascinating cool interesting part of u.s history but born out of a lot of sadness yeah so i get what you're saying though um yeah like maybe i'll be able to put it into better words now but like i wish i was able to experience it because it's such a big part of baseball history like i wish i knew more about these players and about these teams and about this league because you know when we talk about baseball now it's a very it's a very small portion of people that even are able to talk about this part of history and it's such a big part of it and one of the things that I'm hoping for this year, because this year, 2020, is the 100th anniversary of the ne of the Negro Leagues. They were founded in 1920, oh. and I'm really hoping that we see a lot of talk about those those teams as the season progresses, because a lot of the cities that currently have baseball teams had Negro League teams. So 
it'd be really cool to see some promotions. And a lot of Negro League teams were like named after the their major league counterparts, like like the Giants, you know, like um like the Yankees. There is a New York Black Yankees. That was a team. You know, like Interesting. Yeah, it, it was it was not uncommon for those naming conventions to exist. There was an actual like we talk about the Black Sox scandal, but there was also a Negro League team, the Black Sox instead of the White Sox. Like there's a lot of that around in baseball history. And since this is the 100th year anniversary, it'd be really cool to see MLB, who I, I like I said, I do think does uh, some good, some really good things for um, bringing the Negro Leagues to light. I really hope we see them do just, you know, really lean into the celebratory uh, anniversary that is 100 years because that'd be cool. I agree. I agree. Um, and honestly, I don't know if they will, but you know, like a a simple patch on the uniforms, like something to do, like a Negro League memorial, not memorial, but you know, a, a weekend celebrating it, like they do with a, a bunch of other stuff. You know, like there's a bunch of things they can do with it, um, and hopefully, you know, they can get over the oh, is this going to be politically correct? Is this a part of history? What we want to bring up and celebrate. There's yeah, going to be plenty of those meetings, and I really hope that they can get over it and get it right. If you're if you're complaining because you're the team you like is celebrating the Negro Leagues, you're an, you're an asshole. Like you are, you're you're probably like a little bit racist. But you never know. like you're such a fucking asshole. It's like yeah. it's like it's like all the people who complain about Pride Night at at at, at baseball games. Like you just you just hate the gay people. You just hate gay people. <laughs> like sh- just 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 say it. Say it with your chest. Like, you hate gay people. And 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 if your if your city if your team your favorite team is doing a Negro League celebration and you say I don't like that, you're you're, you, you're a little racist. Like you are a little racist. Say it with your chest. You're a little bit racist. <laughs> uh, just just say it. Just say I hate black people. Just say it. <laughs> Like we'll all think you're wrong, but at least it'll be like you know, you'll you'll, you'll keep it funky. Like like, don't even lie. Um. So one of the cool things about about like like the breaking of the color barrier in baseball is just how big of an impact it really had, because black people in America played other sports without having to face quite the same level of barrier. Black people have been playing football for a long. There were granted there were seg- segregated periods of t- of of pretty much all sports, but the barrier getting into the football wasn't as as much. Nor with basketball, but there was this weird mentality around baseball that it was a like it was a white sport. You know, it was it took a certain level of intelligence to play, or some stupid shit. Basically, any argument you've heard against uh, as to uh, or not argument, any anything you've heard a racist person say about why Cam Newton shouldn't be quarterback mm. is like what they would say about baseball. And that's one of the reasons it was so impactful. Like, that's one of the reasons we know who the first black baseball player was um, in the MLB. Jackie Robinson. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. 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 That's why they made all those movies. Uh, but like, and I'm not saying I'm not showing my ignorance as a point of pride, but like, I don't know who the first black football player was or the first black basketball player. And again, that that's my ignorance, but it's, it's, it's because it didn't have the same connotation or context in like the zeitgeist of that time as, as it, as, as as, 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 as baseball did. It was a really monumental thing. Do you want to know who the first black college football player to play in a bowl game was? Oh, yes, I do. Wally Triplett of Penn State. Oh, that's cool. In the Sugar Bowl back in the day. That's awesome. I did uh, not know John that. Mitchell was the first African-American to play varsity football for the University of Alabama. Um, I don't know if that's the first one ever. Uh, George Jewett from Michigan in 1890. That's all wow, 1890. Okay. Yeah. Um. I know Jackie Robinson also played football at mm-hmm. I think USC, uh, UCLA, UCLA, right, right, right. one of those California schools. Yeah, um, he he was football, track and field, and baseball. But uh, 
Man wants to do baseball. That's I, I think I brought this up last year when we talked about the Negro Leagues. Um, is that Jackie Robinson? The reason he ended up getting into the majors wasn't because he was like the best black baseball player, and in fact, he was. There's a lot of mixed feelings about him apparently in the Negro Leagues when he ended up signing to the Dodgers and going to the minor leagues because he wasn't the best player. Like there was a lot of dudes like Satchel Paige who were like, the fuck I'm so much better than him, um, which you can debate about. I'm not going to make a statement on it, but mm-hmm. the, one of the reasons Jackie got picked, like one of the reasons he picked baseball as a sport he pursued in addition to one of the, one of the reasons that he ended up becoming the first black baseball players that he wanted to just, tell everyone to go fuck themselves like he he loved showing people that like hey i'm black and i can do this like me being black has nothing to do with my ability to do this mm-hmm. and i'm going to be better than you at it um apparently the the term for that is race man jackie robinson was a race man he wanted to show everyone that the race was going to move forward so go figure yeah, his uh his teammate at UCLA, Kenny Washington, first black NFL player. Oh shit, that's awesome. Yeah. Do you want to guess what team? Ooh, um, the Steelers. No, the Hollywood Ooh. Bears. The Hollywood oh, that's Bears. Pacific Coast. That's a different professional league. The Los Angeles Rams was the NFL team. Ah, ah okay, that makes sense. Uh, so given that the history of black baseball is so deep, um, there is a really rich history or remembrance of it by a lot of the players. And I wanted to shout out some of the greatest black baseball players in history. So I figured an easy way of doing this, uh, maybe not the best way, but an easy way of doing it would be just looking at the all time war leaderboard for the MLB and talking about. Some of the guys that are on this list. And the first dude whose name appears here is Barry Bonds. Ooh. Barry Bonds, I think we all know this name. Career 162.8 war. Um, he is the all-time leader in home runs, walks, intentional walks. He also has the most MVPs out of any individual player with seven two-time batting title, eight-time gold glove, 12-time silver slugger, three-time major league player of the year, 14-time all-star, and is still sitting on the Hall of Fame ballot, which is absolute fucking insanity. Um, And by far one of the funnest players to talk about because of his stats page. It's absolutely ludicrous, and we've talked about it many times. Um, And he is the first of the black baseball players that appear on this list. He is fourth all-time in war, just behind... Babe Ruth, Walter Johnson, and Cy Young himself. <laughs> um, yeah, Barry Bonds should be a Hall of Famer. My favorite pirate for that, you know, not known for being a pirate. Although it could be. His pirate years were still very good. He won an MVP yeah. as a pirate. I think he had uh, multiple MVPs as a pirate. I I want to say it was just the one because the pirates got rid of him so quickly. Yeah, that's or he or he moved on from the Pirates so quickly. Call it however you want it. Um, He has two with Pittsburgh. Two were they back to back or were they separate? Uh, No, he got second place in the year in between. Okay, gotcha. Duh, what a scrub. Right. Directly after Barry Bonds, the next player on this list is Willie Mays, sitting at number five all time WAR. We talked about him a little bit already. A hundred and fifty six point four war, a Hall of Famer, two time MVP, rookie of the year, now named the Jackie Robinson Award since he was the first to win it. Twenty four time all star, the 1954 World Series champ, 12 time gold glove, a batting title, two time all star MVP and a major league player of the year award. Um, And he fought in Korea in 1953. What a guy. Imagine you go off, you, you fight, you fight in Korea, you come back and the next year. You lead all of baseball in triples, batting average, slugging, OPS, OPS plus, win the MVP and a World Series. <laughs> he's uh he's pretty good. Pretty 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 good. Uh yeah. He lost his age twenty two season. Like that oh god. Willie Mays, what a player. Also very well known for the catch. Do you know the catch? Uh is it like the basket catch? Yeah. So Willie Mays 
in his World Series um, against Cleveland, he was playing in, uh, was it still Polo Grounds? I believe it was still the Polo Grounds at that. Yeah, because they hadn't moved yet. So anyone unaware, look up the dimensions of this fucking place because it's ridiculous. And a long fly ball got hit. Game the I forget which game this was, and I feel so bad that I don't have that in my head, but what can you fucking do? And he was he was running out to go get the ball. And it's if you look at the video, it's a great catch, but you might think to yourself, oh, well, he just catches a ball over his shoulder. No, look, I see Jackie Bradley Jr. doing that shit all the time. The most impressive part about it is how fucking far he had to go to go get that shit. Mm -hmm. So he's running top speed. He's like literally like, basically not even fucking looking. Sticks just sticks his glove out, gets this perfect basket catch, secures it in, holds onto it, and then throws the ball in. It's an amazing play. Uh, I saw like a, a tracking graph, like kind of the way ESPN does uh, their uh, charts for like receivers. It's insane. It's absolutely bananas. Yeah, the the athleticism involved in it, it's ludicrous. Uh, moving on from him, we have Hank Aaron, uh, who have also we've also gone over a little bit. Hank Aaron, one hundred forty three WAR. Um, as we said, he currently is the all time leader in RBIs and total bases. He is also a, in the Hall of Fame. He won an MVP, twenty five time All Star, three time Gold Glove, nineteen fifty seven World Series winner, and two time batting title champ. Um, Hank Aaron, super good at baseball. And no kidding. Also sitting at number seven. In the all-time war leaderboard. Oh, wow. After that, we we run a little bit shy on on well-known black baseball players. The next person on this list, we go down to number nineteen, Ricky Henderson. He's also gonna get a baseball. I'm just gonna stop saying that. That's been a joke I'd make every episode. It's not funny. <laughs> Ricky Henderson, uh. For anyone unaware, I don't know how you're you you would be. Maybe the fastest man to ever live? <laughs> no, no, not not really, but maybe one of the fastest dudes to ever play baseball. Um, he played he played professional baseball for 25 years, starting his career in 1979 with Oakland and ending it in 2003 with the Dodgers, age 44. He retired and I'm sorry, he still is the all-time MLB MLB leader in runs, stolen bases and caught stealing, he has stolen 1406 bases. In his age 43 season, he stole 3 bases with zero caught stealings. Uh sorry, his age 44 season, and he only played in 30 games, which means he stole a base, he stole one base every 10 games, which is a good pace. If all baseball players did that, all baseball players would have like 16 stolen bases or at least 16 attempts every year, which mm -hmm. would be a lot for some baseball players, let me tell you. And he did it when he was 44. In his age 42 season with the Padres, he was tempted 32 stolen bases and got 25 of them. In his age 41 season, he attempted 47 stolen bases and got 36 of them. Hold on. His, his age... Oh, God, I love Ricky Henderson. His age 39, 40, and 41 season, he stole successfully 66, 37, and 36 bases. He got caught stealing 13, 14, and 11 times. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know of anyone that's anywhere even close to that in the past, you know, I don't know, in my lifetime watching baseball. There's nothing like him anymore. There yeah. just isn't. There just isn't. Uh, inner Circle Hall of Famer with his 111.2 war. He uh, is a Hall of Famer. He won an MVP, 10-time All-Star, Gold Glove, ALCS MVP, two-time World Series winner, and three-time Silver Slugger. Uh, and he came about at a time when the Negro Leagues had, had ended and had wrapped. There were still a few guys playing, like Hank Aaron, um, but so the, so the memory was still there, but he was, he was uh, of the generation of black baseball players who ne didn't have to go through the Negro Leagues. And my God, was he just a star sterling example of everything an athlete could be. Um, oh my God. Watching, watching highlight videos of Ricky Henderson play baseball is like watching baseball as it should be played. That's true. 
It's he just play, he didn't hit 50 home runs, so he's not good at baseball. What's his most home run hitting a season? 28. He did it twice. Oh, that's actually really good. Yeah, especially for the era in which he played. I thought it was going to be a lot lower just because we talked about him getting like seven. That one yeah, season. there was. It was the the highest WAR with fewest home runs. Yeah, he has um, uh, he's a hand, uh, not even handful. He's a decent number of fewer than ten home run hitting seasons, but he certainly made up for it by stealing. Let's see, in in his seasons where he stole ten, or sorry, where he hit ten home runs or fewer, he stole um a hundred and thirty bases in nineteen eighty two, which is fucking dumb, might I add. Um, so so he played in one hundred forty nine games that year. That means if he stole one base, if, if, if his stolen bases were all spread out so that there were only one game per stolen base, he stole a base in every single game except for 19 of them. All but 19 of his games. Jesus fuck. I, I know. Wonder, uh... And the craziest part is he got caught stealing 42 times that season, which means he attempted a stolen base 172 times that season. Jesus. And like his, and his... he led the league in walks that year with 116. Um, what like how does his total bases compare in you know the MOP during his years? Because like yeah, he wasn't hitting a lot of home runs, but God, he'd have a lot of total bases unless those aren't counted with steals. Uh, I believe they are. So right, look let's look at Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron's the all-time leader with 6,856. 6, 6, Ricky Henderson, 4,588. So 2,000 base, 2,300 bases fewer. Well, damn, Hank Aaron. Good on you. Oh, that's what you get for hitting 755 home runs. <laughs> I mean, it's just such a stupid number, 755. Uh, yeah, it's not exactly, you know, I, I, yeah, I got nothing. Uh, so which year did he break Babe Ruth's record? Um, 745 be 733. So it would been, it's 1974. He had 20 home runs. God, could you imagine breaking that? I, oh. I, I can't even fathom what that must be like to break what was seen as such an unbreakable record. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. I'm not like my athletic achievements are so far from like breaking all time MLB records that there's no way I could even comprehend what it would be like to do that. Real, real quick, total aside, who do you think has more home runs, A Rod or Mark McGuire? Mark McGuire. A Rod by over 100. What? A Rod has 696 home runs. Mark McGuire is 583. Damn, I didn't realize A Rod had that many fucking home runs. Yeah, Mark McGuire is 62.2 war. A Rod, 117.8. Jesus shit. Yeah, I remember him being only four shy, which is why I looked at Mark McGuire, because I wanted to see how many Mark McGuire had. Um, and I didn't realize it was that many fewer than A Rod. What the fudge, dude? I know. Ain't that some shit. But think 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 about this. All right. Babe Ruth hits seven hundred and fourteen home runs. In like yeah. and like radios were barely a thing, you know? Like he had 714 home runs, and his career ended in like, what was it, like 39 or 40-something? I'm, I'm a terrible baseball fan. I can't think of the year he retired. Uh, I'll pull it up. 35. Sorry, 35. His career ended in 1935. So Babe Ruth, Babe Ruth retires in 1935. He has hit 714 home runs. That is... A comical number. It's something no one. It's inconceivable. Like, like the fact that A Rod came close is impressive, but at no point where you're like, "Wow, no one's ever done this before." You know. Mm -hmm. 
I can't even think of what it would be like to re to to really push a game forward as much as he did. And then since then, only two people have done it: Hank Aaron and Barry Bonds. And so imagine you're Hank Aaron. All right, mm-hmm. you you started off as a Negro leaguer in Indianapolis, and then you ended up going and signing a major league deal with with the uh, I think the Braves. Yeah, the, yeah, the Milwaukee Braves. Um, and then you have a stellar career, and that carries you all the way into a, a, a city change as the Braves move to Atlanta. And then all of a sudden, you've been playing for almost 20 years. No, 20 years. You've been playing baseball for 20 years. It's the 70s. You are 40 years removed from Babe Ruth's retirement. And you are on the cusp of breaking one of baseball's unbreakable records. As a black man in Atlanta that started off playing Negro League baseball in Indianapolis in the 50s. That's got to be some shit. Yeah, like that's that's a whole nother level of not even just achievement, but I don't think symbolism is the right word, but like you know what I'm trying to say there, like it's, yeah, like the, the like greatness, but like I know what you mean, but like a specific t- kind of greatness. Mm-hmm. I mean, I if if you get the chance, watching the video of him hitting the 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 home run to finally do it is just such a powerful video because. It just meant so much. And like fans pour onto the field and round the bases with him. Which I kind of really wish that was still a, a thing. Yeah, I know. Um, now you will get banned from all baseball stadiums for life. If you, but just dumb. I mean, my God. And the only two players to have ever bested Babe Ruth's career home runs are, are, are both black baseball players, Hank Aaron and Barry Bonds. Yeah. Both of which should be Hall of Famers. Both of which should. Uh, there is only one other b- a black baseball player in the top 25 in career war. Do you have any guesses as to who that is? Um, uh, I, I, I can't. No, I can't. You know him. You love him. Frank Robinson. Oh, okay. Frank Robinson. Uh, he is number... Uh, where did you just go, Frank Robinson? You're number 24 on this list with his 107.3 career war. He is... The, he is in the Hall of Fame, two-time MVP, Rookie of the Year winner, Triple Crown uh, winner or earner, whatever, 14-time All-Star, two-time World Series champ, a Gold Glove, a World Series MVP, an All-Star MVP, a batting title, a Major League Player of the Year, and a Manager of the Year award, as he owns the distinction of being the first manager in the Negro, uh, not the Negro Leagues, in the National League and American League. Ain't that some shit? That is, in fact, some shit. And I believe he's also the first MVP winner in the American League and the National League. Really? No, he must not be. No, it's just manager. Never mind. Sorry. Oh, he's the first player to win MVP in the American League and the National League. Gotcha. Because at, there was at a point in time in baseball where like you basically owned the players. You know, like he played mm-hmm. from 1956 to 1976. So he retired pretty much right as free agency was becoming a thing. And before that, like the team owned your contract. Like you didn't negotiate really. Uh, like not really like you do now. Yeah. We went in depth on this when we talked about uh free agency. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, at this point, when he retired, uh, Kurt flood did his whole thing, but for the bulk of your career, like if, if you are a guy who won MVP as Frank Robinson won MVP and rookie of the year in Cincinnati, you don't you don't usually get traded because your contract value isn't going to increase to an exorbitant degree. And yet he got traded to Baltimore, where he won MVP again. So uh he's one of the Cincinnati greats, he's one of the um 
uh, Baltimore greats. He's one of the MLB greats. He was a phenomenal manager after this. Uh, I mean, really just a just ridiculous career. Yeah, he was a um, manager of the Cleveland Indians in the American League and from 1975 to 1977. And then he was the manager of the San Francisco Giants in the National League in 1981 through 1984. He also managed the Orioles from 88 to 91, the Expos from 2002 to 2004. And then he managed the Nationals because they became the Nationals, the Washington Nationals, for, in 05 and 06. And uh, what a fucking guy. Oh, 100%. He is, and again, I just said I'm not going to do that anymore, and I just tried it. He's also considered to be like one of like the nice dudes of baseball. It, he unfortunately passed away uh, just last year. Um, actually, today, one year ago today. Really? February 7th, 2019. Damn, rest in peace. Wow, this should have been the Frank Robinson tribute episode, um, and I'm going to title it as such, even though we didn't. Um, but he, he was one of those dudes like, cause he managed so recently. I know Oh six doesn't feel recent, but in the grand scheme of baseball, it very much so is. There's a lot of commentators that are commentating who are like played for Frank Robinson when he was a manager. Um, and so there's a lot of stories floating around on TV about him every time his name comes up because so many commentators played under Frank Robinson. And I have never heard anyone say anything remotely, possibly negative about him. Universally loved figure. And by all accounts, righteous baseball player. Anybody else you got on your list that uh, you want to, I guess, commemorate? Uh, Yeah, there's only one other person. There's one final black player who uh, got more than 100 career war in their lifetime. Any guesses? I don't think you're going to get it. Uh, I don't think I will either. Horribly specific. Joe Morgan. Joe Morgan. Joe Morgan and his 100.6 career war. He is in the Hall of Fame. Two-time MVP, 10-time All-Star, two-time World Series winner, five-time Gold Glove, an All-Star MVP, a Silver Slugger, a two-time Major League Player of the Year. He played four the Houston Astros banged them trash cans from 1963 to 1971. Then the Cincinnati Reds under the big red machine. He played from 1972 to 1979, 1980. He was back in Houston and then 81, 82. He was in San Francisco, 83 in Philadelphia and 84 in Oakland. Um, he never, he, I'm sorry. He led the league in a bunch of things. He doesn't hold any lifetime career records as some of the other players we have highlighted have, but by all accounts, a great baseball player. Uh, yeah, I, I can't say I'm, he's probably the only one here that I'm very much not familiar with. Yeah. Uh, once I, once I rem- rem- remember that he was on the big red machine, uh, my memory kicked in a little bit, but he's not a guy you think about very often. He, it's weird. He's one of the, the, the few of these 100 war players who like name doesn't immediately jump out at you. Like he's currently sandwiched in between Randy Johnson and Albert Pujols on the war leaderboard yeah. two exceedingly recognizable names. And then if you go one further in each direction of that sandwich, um, it's Christy Mathewson, one of the greats of all time, and Warren Spahn, uh, another great, but a little bit more recent. I wouldn't say one of the original greats like Christy Mathewson was. Um, but anyway, like very recognizable names. Um, whereas Joe Morgan was just always a very good baseball player. He was like a, he was like a five-win player his entire career, basically. Which is very difficult, to say the least. Oh, yeah. Super hard. Uh, Speaks volumes to who he was as a player. Um, So I don't think I really have anything else to say beyond that. Uh, I just want to say that I love the Negro Leagues. I think it's a great... As someone who just enjoys history and enjoys baseball, it is like just the perfect combination of things for me. Um, I also, as we, I, I think we all know, love the underdog story. And if there's ever an underdog story, it's how the Negro Leagues damn near forced integration to baseball too by just showing how good their athletes were. Um, it is a valuable part of baseball history, of U.S. history, of black history. Um, 
this being Black History Month, I love doing this episode every month, or every year. Uh, I'll probably try to touch on it a few more times as we go through the month in smaller portions, as there's no need to do an, another full episode on it this year or this month yet, since we just did this. But I highly recommend looking this shit up on YouTube or going so far as to be more engaged with it on Twitter or check out um, the Negro League Baseball Museum's website and even going so far as to visit if you so choose. I went out of my way to go there last year. It is not disappointing. I can guarantee you that. It's su- it's a small joint, but it's super fucking cool and a great, really interesting part of town. I loved Kansas City. Um, and the man who runs it does a phenomenal job doing so. So that's all I got. Damn. This was a, this was a fun little episode that kind of just, uh, you know, sprung up on us. Yeah, we kind of threw it together a little bit last minute just to just to give you all, y'all a, a peek behind the curtain. But it, I, I, we in part a little bit threw it together last minute because I, I knew it wouldn't be hard finding things to talk about with this. It, there's so much to talk about with this. It's one of the reasons I love talking about it. Yeah, it's um, like I, I think we were saying this earlier. I, I don't know in these specific words, but it is something that deserves to be talked about more. Um, and it's something that, you know, I'm glad we get to talk about, you know, maybe not regularly, but now and again, whenever we, uh, we feel like we want to talk about it. There's, and it's so cool because, because it, it, the history is so disjointed on it or, or, um, passed down in a folklore sense. There's always shit to be learned about it. Like I just heard another Satchel Page story that I hadn't heard because the uh, the Negro League Baseball Museum president was doing an interview on MLB Network, and he told you want to hear this really quick Satchel Page story. Yeah, um, you can look up the video of it, and it'll be a better telling than I'm going to give because I only just heard it recently. But uh, a Satchel Page was pitching a game in the majors, so not not in the Negro Leagues, I believe, in the majors. I, it, it, ah, damn it! Now I already feel bad. I'm already fu- possibly fucking this up. I'm going to say in the majors because it makes the story better. Um. And one of the opposing players in the opposing dugout shouted a racial slur at him while he was pitching. And in response to that, Satchel Page had one of his infielders come and sit down by the mound, effectively putting him a man short in on defense, and then th- threw an immaculate inning. <laughs> Three strikeouts, nine pitches. And that's amazing. Yeah, that's isn't that like or I don't know about significantly, but isn't that more rare to have you know to have happened more rare of an occurrence than a perfect game? No, perfect game is just only twenty three. It's more rare than a no hitter. Okay. Yeah, because I think I think there's over like I want to say there's over three hundred no hitters, but there's only twenty three perfect games. And there's only, I'm not sure there's a hundred immaculate innings. There might only be like 90 something. Uh, as of early 2015, there have been 80 immaculate innings in baseball history. Yeah. I remember um, it being in the 80s a couple of years ago. So I'm just kind of extrapolating it out to the 90s now. Yeah. But regardless, it's fucking close. There's not a lot. It's hard. Yeah, no kidding. And Satchel Page did it seemingly out of spite by sheer force of will. Which is the best way to do something. Which is, yeah. It's just, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna be the best at anything, doing being the best at something out of spite is the best way to be the best at something. Like having someone heckle you like that and then just saying, All right, go fuck yourself, and then completely dominating their team is oof. Mwah. Perfection. Uh, uh, isn't it ever? Um, any any final thoughts? Um, talk to talk to people about the Negro Leagues because they should know about it. Yeah, ask your friends, your family, or talk to them. Seriously, not even joking. It's such a it's such a fun thing to talk about. The uniforms are cool. The history is is cool. The players are all all have cool stories and shit. Some of them are going to be sad because that's the part of history it was in. But I mean, it's just such a fascinating topic. I fucking love it. I agree with Corbin. Thank you. 
That'd all right. Great. Anything else? Nope. All right. Well, if you want to follow the show on Twitter, you can do so at Juicing Pod. If you want to hit us up via Gmail, you can do so at Juicing the Numbers at gmail.com. And until Thursday, y'all have a good one. Bye. Shit. Sure.